filming live from the firehouse in downtown North Manchester. It's Good Night with Christopher Blue with special guest Karen Day Suarez. I'm your co host Reverb, and here's your host, Christopher Blue. Hello, and welcome to Good Night with Christopher Blue. I'm Christopher Blue, and we have a wonderful show for you tonight. Tonight's guest is a published author, uh, and she is a talk show host in her own right. But before we get to that... Subscribe. Please, subscribe. This road to a thousand has been hard. Subscribe. And I don't even know if we've quite made it yet. This is our current subscription count at the release of this video. Subscribe. When we come back, Karen Day Sorens. Subscribe. Oh, well, sweet reverb. You're, you're back from, from patrol. Are, are you wearing Good Night with Christopher Blue merch? It's a guilty pleasure, okay? Welcome back. Subscribe. Uh, <laughs> tonight's guest uh, has written many books, um, and she, she's just a, a pleasant woman to speak with. Take it away, Chris, out of studio. Thanks, Chris. I am here with Karen Day Suarez. Hello. Hi. Hello, hello. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. So excited. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are here today to talk about um, your first novel, uh, Living Crazy Like Fly, um, yep. which is um, a true story about your life. Um, what was it like to put your life on paper? Well, it was very healing for me. Um, I didn't write it till I was in, well, the book's 20 years old, so it's been 20 years since then. And um, I've been taking, I've had anxiety and things all my life. And I was diagnosed with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, that was kind of like a shock because you think, well, you wouldn't think, you know, I know guys in the military and stuff get it, but I would have never thought that, you know, that's what I ended up getting too. So it was very, both medically and spiritually good for me to, to really put it down on paper and get it out. Yeah. So, and I've met so many people since then too. You meet so many people that say, Hey, I went through the same thing. And I'm like, I don't know what it is about the sixties, the fifties, late fifties and sixties, you know, but so many people our age had gone through the exact same thing and you didn't know it because you didn't talk about it back then. Right. Um, and, and it was, and so what, what you were talking about is, um, is the child abuse you faced, um, which you, right. talk, you talk about extensively in the book. Um, and, and it, it blows my mind because I mean, I had uh, my share of, of childhood issues, but to read about your life, you know, I, it kind of makes me think that my life was a cakewalk growing up. <laughs> um, but yeah, not only that, but then um, you also write about um, how you were treated in school and um, this, this one instance had to have been very traumatic for you where you were shoved in a locker. Um, right. Cause I dared to try out to be a cheerleader and some of the other girls didn't like it. And I can steal it when I hear that song, you know, Rocky Mountain Way or what, or, you know, it just kind of freaks me out because if they hadn't found me when they did, I would have been dead. I would have suffocated in there. The only thing that saved me was a piece of my hair was hanging through a vent wow. and the janitor saw it in there. So, and smoke on the water that that was playing too but um yeah but other than that i mean my f actual friends in high school got me through everything that which, i had like which is you know another two big, different personas yeah <laughs> yeah that, that's another big portion of this book is is um you know if it's hard to summarize what this book is in in you know a, a small sentence uh because this book is an obvious love letter to your friends um it is uh, a love letter to your first love, um, you know, and, and it, it also touches base on, on those traumatic events in your life. Um, uh, before we started this interview, you, you had said that you're actually redoing this book and adding more to mm -hmm. it. Is that because there was so much more that was left out or, uh, mm -hmm. did you feel you needed to go more into detail about certain things? Well, um, my, one of my brothers, Mark, the one that's right under me, actually, he went through more than anybody in our family. 
And he was the first one when I wrote it. He said, you sure left a lot out. And I said, well, I didn't want people to get too depressed because some of the chapters are really like, oh, man, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but there is more of a story that needs to be told. And that was just the first 18 years. But I have another book that's going to be separate of when I went to Ball State and went to college and everything there. That's another whole book just in itself. And I want to get that one done also. But, um, yeah, I, I want to rewrite it. I have so many people ask me because I did kind of leave it up in the air at the end. It's got one of those, well, what happened kind of ending, you know, because <laughs> I wanted there to be more. And I wanted people to ask for more. But I think now when I redo it, I will put an epilogue, you know, like 20 years later, what has happened to everybody because they really want to know. So, but yeah, it was very, I, I would recommend it to anybody. If anybody had any kind of life like that, put it down on paper. And I worked all day at the hospital and I wrote the book at night. I'd come home and I'd start maybe about 11 or so when it got quiet. And I would just sit there and I'd quit maybe four or five. And I'd been sitting there crying all night, you know, just reading, reading it back and stuff. So, but I wrote it for my nieces and nephews because there were six of us and of the kids. And once you got away, everybody scattered to the four winds, you know, so we didn't see anybody. Yeah. And she wanted to know the story of the family because she'd only seen my parents twice in her whole life. And she was the first grandchild. So I wrote it really for all of them. But it has just gone so much farther than that. And that's really touched me and made it all worthwhile. You know, I keep thinking, oh, I used to pray to God. Why? Why is this happening? You know, but I know now why it did and, and everything. But it was hard. It was very hard at the time. And like now, I mean, I'm still dealing with medical problems. We all have, med I have end stage renal disease. I'm in third stage kidney failure. Because my dad kicked me in the back so many times and sent me down that long hallway that I talked about. The bowling alley, that's what we called it. <laughs> that he actually flattened my right one to like a pancake and it doesn't even work. Wow. So he all got his mark on each of us somehow. It had a lasting effect. So let hope there's a place they go where they can see, you know? Yeah. I hope. Do, do you have any fond memories of, of your parents at all, or, or has it all just been completely stained by um, the evil that they brought into your life? I really don't have any happy, because he always ruined the holidays for us, you know, and then um, at first, I remember when I was little on Valentine's Day, he used to bring me a teddy bear and my mom a box of candy. Well, she got mad about that, because she was like, she's, why are you getting her anything, you know, so that quit. And little things like that. I mean, it was like, what did I do? <laughs> you know, he was just trying to make an effort and be nice and give me a little something for Valentine's as his sweetheart or whatever too, but she ended that. Wow. So there was really nothing. I really don't have any fun memories of him. I have fun memories of us, the kids. Mm -hmm. You know, my brother and I singing in church, and I always remember that at Christmas time. And, you know, and us playing around and doing stuff of, of them, no. Mm -hmm. No. It's not a thing. You dedicate this book to your daughter, Lauren. Mm -hmm. um, and she's obviously been um, a, a huge motivation in your life. Um, what uh, do you ever fear that, that um, you get trapped in the circle of, of generational trauma and, and that there's something that you're maybe carrying from your childhood in, into your daughter? Yeah, no, I don't think so, because um, out of the six kids, three of us were like my dad, mm -hmm. and three of us were the complete opposite, and I'm one of those. I always swore I would be the complete opposite. If anything, I overdid her. I spoiled her too bad that she didn't appreciate anything, because I wanted her to do all the things I didn't get to do, like Girl Scouts and dance lessons and ballet and gym, and, you know, and she was like, yeah, I really don't want to do this kind of stuff. I'm like, okay, well, I always want to <laughs> But, you know, and Tommy Hilfiger clothes laying on the floor. I remember that. I was lucky if I had just a couple outfits to live on. <laughs> but it's funny that um, my dad's favorite uh, kid, Scotty, which he always talked about, ended up being just like him. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, arrested and had the ankle blurry slit and all that for what he did to his stepdaughter, beating her up and stuff. So I think it was very funny that, uh, <clears throat> and we none of us really have relations with him anymore. Yeah. He lives in north webster i believe because he's just exactly like my dad and i said i think that's so funny that the one that was his favorite was ended up just like him yeah looks like him acted like him and it's just really weird 
really strange. But yeah, we don't see him. We really don't have time to see each other. I haven't seen my one brother, Paul. No, he lived in San Diego. Like I said, we got scattered everywhere. I've got a brother that lives in in uh, St. Louis. And then I'm here now. I moved from Florida to here when I got divorced. Mm -hmm. And um, I got a sister in Lovensport, but I we don't see each other very much. <laughs> Everybody's too busy. Yeah. Busy times. I understand that. Busy times. So... But I think the message got put out and I was just really thankful that it did. And I wasn't alone at that time. So when when the book came out, um, I, I've read a lot of reviews about people um, saying like they're glad they read this because they felt like they weren't alone in this. Um, do you think you've you felt that you've been able to like really resonate with people or is it just you don't even think about it. Um, it's you're, you're just telling oh, your no. story. Yeah, no, I think I really resonate with them a lot. Even the love story part too. There's been quite a few people that have had that happen where they kind of like lost the person, you know, and that kind of backfired because like I said, I kind of went cause I was curious and just wanted to, you know, you've always got that. What if thing I wanted to see him. And then when we saw each other, it, it hurt, you know, we were both upset and, um, I found out some things that I was going to put in the next book. You know, he came looking for me and my dad threw him in a 180 direction, you know, after I'd gone to Ball State. So he couldn't find me. He had broke up with a girl he wanted to, you know, was going to marry. He wanted to come back to me and I lost him again. And so I'm going to write about that. And but we haven't seen each other or talk to each other anymore after that day. It was just too hard. Everybody says, well, what, what was going through your mind? I said, at the time, I wish now I just grabbed him and kissed him. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have had that memory, at least, you know, have something. Maybe in the movie we'll do that. I don't know. <laughs> no. so, but my sister was right there, too, so I couldn't do anything. And, uh... Uh, so, yeah, speaking of, of Jeff, um, you, you, you had said at the end of the book, um, uh, spoilers a little bit, um, that at that moment you still hadn't told him everything that had happened. Um, do you, did you leave anything out of, out of the book at that point or, or um, have you still not verbally spoken to him about what happened in your childhood? No, he knew, he knew all my friends knew what was going on and all their parents knew how my parents were. Hmm. But my dad was a big deal over at Murphy's medical center, which was the old hospital in Warsaw before it went out of business. And he also was at church. We went to the priest. We went to all our relatives. We went to the neighbors. If you ran away, I remember being little and running away with my lunchbox and with my Winnie the Pooh and maybe a couple clothes to the neighbors. And I could hear her calling my mom. Yeah, she's over here, blah, blah, blah. I can't get it through their head. You don't know how much worse you just made this for us. Right. You know, because back then you couldn't call the police to come and help you. They didn't do that for kids. Right. So, and it's like, nobody would listen. Nobody would help. So at least now I think there is some more of that. I still think it goes on too much, you know, and I'm so glad I'm not in high school now because I think I, somebody would, I would end up shot or something, <laughs> <laughs> you know, now it's, it's terrible. Yeah. But I, you know, we were laughing with my friends a couple of weeks ago. I said, yeah, I can remember. Cause I went to Warsaw high school. I said, yeah, I can remember everybody out in the parking lot with their rifles up in the back of their trucks, you know, and nobody think anything of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now it's, it's terrible. So I, I give all the thanks to my editor, Cheffy, for, for all the editing. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, is, is there any, is there any one message that, that you want to, to say to people who um, may be struggling um, and, and are, are in an abusive situation themselves and, and don't know how to get themselves out of it. You got to tell somebody and see, I had my friends to tell, or I probably would not have been here. I had my friends and we were all kids and there was only so much we all could do, but I still had them. They knew what was going, going on. Their parents knew too, like I said, but back then nobody wanted to get involved. It was just, you know. And um, like my neighbor, I don't know if I mentioned in the book or not, years later when we went to see her, because I wanted to see my old house. We went across the street and she's the one that called my mom when I ran away when I was little. Of course, I got beat more when I got home for doing that. And she said, um, I always felt so sorry for you kids. And I just exploded on her. I was mad. I said, but you don't know what you did. Yeah. You didn't help us. 
You know, you made things 10 times worse for us. Um, if it snowed and one of my brothers ran away or something, they ran somebody's house, they'd call and say, hey, they're over here. So, and like my brother, Mark, I think I couldn't, I think I wrote in there how he left. You know, dad just got him up in the middle of the night and started beating him up. And he threw him out in the snow. And then he sat in the house in the dark with his rifle on his lap waiting for him to come back. And he never did. And I tried to get to the phone and call the police that time. And my mom's like, go back to bed, mind your own business, you know, kind of thing. I said, he didn't do anything. So, but the joke was on dad that time because he, he never came back. So. Where can people go um, to, to pick up this book themselves and, and check it out? Well, Amazon has it on sale right now for like $13. So that's pretty good. So it's, you can find it pretty much anywhere. Um, Barnesandnoble.com, booksamillion.com. It's still online, quite a few places. Okay. It was a really big deal when it came out. Because in the book, I didn't really name my parents, you know, they were just called mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And then when the book came out, I did a big signing over at the Holiday Inn and I had a lot of people there. And then the Warsaw Times Union put a front page story on there that James and Evelyn Colt from Warsaw, Indiana were blah, blah, blah. I went, oh, no. <laughs> 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 so luckily, I'd seen a, a lawyer and I'd also been on Oprah. I don't know if I told you that, too. Um, I was in the first of Oprah's book clubs story because she was in Gary, Indiana is where she grew up. You there? Uh, I think I think we're freezing. There you are. Yeah. But anyway, her story was about the poor the poor black girl that grew up in Gary and had, you know, and my story was the girl that's dad was, you know, a doctor and he was a big deal at church and well respected and he had an airplane and he had all the boats and all this stuff. And I said neither nobody would help either one of us at the time. So that's really why she had me on her show, and that was great. Back in the days before they had this, and she actually had to fly me to Chicago <laughs> <laughs> and put me up in a hotel. So, But it was great. But I will be working on redoing it. There's so much more I want to add to it. Um, the one after it is going to be Danza because um, they ended up – I went to Ball State, and they gave me my own room and all this stuff. I couldn't get student loans because my dad was a doctor. But um, they let, they paid for the first year, and then all of a sudden they quit paying the bill, and uh, I got called to the dean's office and said, well, you owe us about 30000 How are you going to pay this? And I went, what? And they had forged my name on all these student loan bills. Mm. So I had to move out of the dorm, and I had to become a dancer to help pay for bills. Plus, I was working at a drugstore, Hags, in Muncie, part-time, making $75 every two weeks, you know. So that's another story. And then my good friend there was murdered there's a murder involved and all that and that was covered up by the state police and yeah so that, that's another book just by itself so it just kept going the world did not stop for me there and go oh <laughs> yeah well I, I definitely um, I, I, I can't wait to to read more and then to see what what happens after um, I'll make sure the link to uh, Living Crazy Like Flies in the description of this video. Please check it out yourself. Um, it is a, a very good read, um, and I, I highly recommend it. Um, Karen, again. Darling, did you let your fiancé read it? What's that? You have to let your fiancé read it. Yes, definitely. I, I will, uh, I'll definitely um, convince her. She, she's a big reader, so she has a lot of books that she's been reading, but uh, I'll definitely have her put this on her list. <laughs> I sure appreciate you having me on, and I'd love to come back, and maybe we can talk about something else next time, because yeah. I teach writing still, you know, and people would have questions about, like, getting their show like you did, you know, we can talk about that sometime, or how to pitch, find an agent, something like that, or how to get really serious about it. Absolutely. But the Absolutely. money now, I've learned, is in um, screenplays. That's where it is. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have you back in the future, and... Um... Yeah, again, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. I send it back to me in the studio to close out the show. Thanks, Chris. That's our show. Thank you guys so much for subscribing. Just subscribe. Where are the other subscribers? <laughs> and don't Where forget to they? ring that bell so you get notified whenever we upload new content. Until next time, good night, my sweet baby angels. I'll see you in the future.